Burkina Faso's path to independence has been really rough, marked by a fierce struggle against the vestiges of Western colonial domination. Once known as Upper Volta, the country was a part of France's vast colonial empire in West Africa. The colonial administration imposed French cultural, economic, and political systems, disregarding local social structures and exploiting the region's resources for the benefit of the metropole. When France finally relinquished control in 1960, the newly formed nation was left to navigate the treacherous waters of self-governance, burdened by the artificial borders and ethnic divisions imposed by colonial rule. These borders, drawn with little regard for the ethnic and cultural realities on the ground, planted the seeds of future conflicts. The promise of independence quickly gave way to internal strife as political instability, economic challenges, and external pressures took their toll. The West's fingerprints were all over these challenges. France, the former colonial power, maintained a tight grip on its former colonies' economies and politics, ensuring that true independence was more of a dream than a reality. Mechanisms like the CFA franc, a currency directly linked to the French treasury, allowed France to continue exerting economic control over its former colonies, including Burkina Faso. Meanwhile, the Cold War saw Western powers, particularly the United States and France, playing out their geopolitical games in Africa, often at the expense of the continent's nascent democracies. In Burkina Faso, this manifested in a series of coups and counter-coups as different factions vied for power with the tacit or explicit support of external actors. The assassination of Thomas Sankara in 1987, a charismatic leader who sought to break free from Western influence and forge a truly independent path for Burkina Faso, was a turning point in the country's history. Sankara's death, widely believed to have taken place with the involvement of foreign powers, marked the end of his revolutionary government and the beginning of a period of political stagnation. But the real damage came in the form of economic exploitation. Like many African nations, Burkina Faso was integrated into a global economy designed to serve Western interests. Its resources, particularly gold, were extracted and exported, while its people were left to deal with the consequences. The structural adjustment programs imposed by Western-dominated financial institutions in the 1980s only worsened the situation, stripping the government of its ability to invest in social services and infrastructure. These programs, enforced by the International Monetary Fund IMF, and the World Bank, demanded austerity measures that resulted in cuts to education, healthcare, and social welfare programs, exacerbating poverty and inequality. Fast forward to the 21st century, and Burkina Faso is still grappling with the effects of this legacy. The insurgency that now threatens the country is a direct result of the power vacuums and economic disparities created by Western interference. Jihadist groups operating in the Sahel region have thrived in this environment, exploiting the weaknesses left by years of Western exploitation and neglect. These groups, often armed with weapons supplied through Western channels or looted from Western-backed regimes in neighboring countries, have capitalized on the discontent among Burkina Faso's marginalized populations, offering them a sense of purpose and belonging that their government has struggled to provide. The West's involvement in Burkina Faso didn't end with the formal end of colonialism, it has taken on new and more insidious forms. While the days of direct colonial rule are over, Western powers have continued to exert influence through military interventions, economic policies, and political pressure. This influence is often masked as aid or partnership, but the underlying dynamics of power and control remain the same. One of the most glaring examples of this is the so-called War on Terror, which has seen Western nations, particularly the United States and France, engage in military operations across the Sahel region. These interventions, often justified as efforts to combat terrorism, have only served to destabilize the region further. In Burkina Faso, the presence of Western military forces has not only failed to bring peace but has also fueled anti-Western sentiment and driven recruitment for jihadist groups. The establishment of military bases, drone operations, and special forces missions in the Sahel have created a militarized environment that exacerbates existing tensions. These operations, often conducted with little regard for the local context, have resulted in civilian casualties, displacement, and the destruction of livelihoods. 
the economic front is no better. Western-dominated financial institutions continue to impose policies that prioritize debt repayment and foreign investment over the needs of the local population. The conditionalities attached to loans and aid packages often require Burkina Faso to adopt neoliberal policies that benefit foreign investors at the expense of the local economy. This has left Burkina Faso's government with few resources to address the underlying causes of the insurgency, such as poverty, unemployment, and lack of access to education and healthcare. Moreover, Western governments and corporations remain deeply involved in the extraction of Burkina Faso's natural resources, particularly gold, with the profits flowing out of the country and leaving behind environmental degradation and social unrest. It is within this context that Captain Ibrahim Traore's government operates, trying to navigate a complex web of domestic and international pressures while fighting a war that has been exacerbated by the very powers that now claim to offer support. The West, while publicly condemning the insurgency and offering military assistance, continues to pursue policies that undermine Burkina Faso's sovereignty and stability. The contradictions in Western policy, supporting authoritarian regimes when it suits their interests while preaching democracy and human rights, are not lost on the people of Burkina Faso. Faced with an existential threat from the insurgency and the ongoing legacy of Western exploitation, Captain Ibrahim Traore has made the controversial decision to expand his military forces by recruiting widows, orphans, and former members of the Volunteer Defense Forces VDP. This strategy, while unconventional, reflects the harsh realities on the ground in Burkina Faso. It is a response born out of necessity, not choice, and highlights the difficult decisions that leaders in the global south often have to make when faced with crises that have roots far beyond their borders. The recruitment of widows and orphans is not just a desperate measure, it is a strategic decision rooted in the understanding that the fight for Burkina Faso's future cannot be won by conventional means alone. These recruits bring with them a deep personal connection to the conflict, having lost loved ones to the very forces they now fight. This gives them a unique motivation and resolve that cannot be easily replicated by professional soldiers. In a conflict where morale and the will to fight are often as important as military tactics, the emotional and psychological strength of these recruits is a significant asset. Moreover, Troy's decision to prioritize former VDP members ensures that the newly expanded forces will include individuals with experience in guerrilla warfare and local knowledge of the terrain. These are critical assets in a conflict where conventional military tactics have often failed to yield results. The VDP, originally formed as a community-based militia to protect local villages from jihadist attacks, has a deep understanding of the local context. Their experience in asymmetrical warfare, coupled with their intimate knowledge of the local geography, makes them invaluable in the fight against insurgents who often use the terrain to their advantage. But Traore's strategy also speaks to a broader understanding of the need for national unity. By recruiting from among the families of fallen soldiers, the government is reinforcing the idea that the fight against the insurgency is not just a military campaign but a collective struggle for the survival of the nation. This approach is designed to foster a sense of shared purpose and resilience among the population, even as the country faces immense challenges. In a nation as diverse as Burkina Faso, with its many ethnic and linguistic groups, fostering a sense of national unity is crucial. Traore's recruitment strategy, by involving those who have been most directly affected by the conflict, aims to build a sense of collective ownership over the country's future. Yet, even with these strategies, the question remains, can Burkina Faso truly achieve stability and security in the face of such overwhelming odds? The path to stability and security for Burkina Faso is fraught with challenges, both internal and external. Internally, the country must address the root causes of the insurgency, including poverty, unemployment, and the lack of access to basic services. This requires a government that is not only strong militarily but also capable of delivering on its promises of economic development and social justice. Troy's government will need to undertake significant reforms to address these challenges, even as it fights a war on multiple fronts. One of the most pressing internal challenges is the economic situation. Burkina Faso's economy remains heavily dependent on agriculture and mining, with the latter dominated by foreign corporations. 
diversifying the economy, investing in sustainable development, and ensuring a more equitable distribution of the country's resources will be crucial in addressing the grievances that have fueled the insurgency. Externally, Burkina Faso must confront the legacy of Western interference and assert its sovereignty in the face of ongoing attempts by foreign powers to maintain their influence. This will require a delicate balancing act, as the country navigates the complex geopolitical landscape of the Sahel region. Developing strategic partnerships with other African nations, strengthening regional cooperation, and exploring alternative economic and political models that prioritize the needs of the local population will be essential in this endeavor. For corporations to achieve long-term stability, they will need to diversify their operations and reduce their dependence on volatile global markets. This will require a strategic shift away from reliance on extractive industries and towards sectors that can provide more sustainable growth and employment. One key aspect of this is diversifying the product and service portfolio. Rather than focusing solely on commodities or other primary goods that are subject to price fluctuations, successful corporations will invest in manufacturing, technology, and service-based offerings. These sectors tend to be less vulnerable to external shocks and can provide more stable sources of revenue and jobs. In addition to diversifying their business lines, corporations must also work to strengthen their local and regional ties. Overly heavy dependence on global supply chains and export markets leaves companies exposed to geopolitical tensions and trade disruptions. By building stronger relationships with domestic suppliers, partners, and customers, corporations can reduce their vulnerability and create more locally rooted growth. This shift towards greater self-reliance and regional integration must be accompanied by investments in workforce development and innovation. Providing high-quality training, education, and skills-building programs will equip employees to navigate changing market conditions. Likewise, directing resources into research, development, and deployment of new technologies will help corporations stay ahead of the curve and maintain their competitive edge. Crucially, this transformation cannot succeed without strong, ethical corporate governance. Reducing corruption, increasing transparency, and aligning business objectives with the broader public interest will be essential. Corporations must see themselves as stakeholders in the long-term health and prosperity of the communities in which they operate, not just short-term profit centers. Of course, implementing these changes will require overcoming significant challenges. Shifting away from established business models and power structures is never easy and may face resistance from vested interests. Additionally, the global economic landscape is highly complex, with multinational corporations wielding immense influence. Navigating this environment while maintaining autonomy and community-focused priorities will demand sophisticated political and diplomatic skills. Nevertheless, the potential benefits of this approach are substantial. By building more diversified, self-reliant, and socially responsible business models, corporations can achieve greater long-term stability and resilience. This, in turn, creates a foundation for sustainable growth, employment, and community development, outcomes that are essential for addressing the pressing economic and social challenges facing societies around the world. Ultimately, the path to long-term corporate stability mirrors the challenges faced by nations like Burkina Faso. Just as countries must reduce dependence on volatile global markets, build stronger regional ties, and invest in domestic capacity, so too must corporations chart a course towards greater self-reliance and community-focused development. In doing so, they can not only secure their own futures, but also contribute to the creation of a more equitable and prosperous world. Thanks for watching till the end. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like as well as a sub so more people can see this.